You can try. <laughs> Wait a second. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. It's so exciting to be here. Um, I want to thank Fabio and Simona for welcoming us to come. Um, this has become a tradition that we look forward to very, very much. And we are greatly appreciative of your time. And it's exciting to talk about disability studies across international contexts, because I do think we get a tad isolated in the US. <laughs> like in a lot of things. <laughs> Whole other conversation we could have about isolationist politics. but. Um, I'm going to talk today about disability studies and disability studies education around uh, three key areas, key tenets, current tensions, and new directions. And interestingly enough, it's like Simona and I were sitting next to each other when we wrote our presentations. So some of what I'm going to talk about is very, very, very connected and in some ways very similar. So I'll try to take things in a slightly different direction. So I'm feeling old right now. My daughter is 17. Oh my God. Um, but this is her picture on her first day of kindergarten. She had attended a fully inclusive elementary school, Juonio, J-O-W-O-N-I-O, -O -O, and you should look it up, um, whether you're from the U.S. or Italy. It was one of the first preschools in the country. Over 45 years ago, they started actively seeking students with disabilities to attend and have maintained a constructivist, inclusive philosophy for the 45 years since then. So while my daughter was a student there, there was a boy in her class who did not speak, and he did not walk. And being the good disability studies scholar that I was, I used her as research. So as she was riding in the car with me one day on the way to school, I said, hey, Laura, how do you play with Jacob? And she rolled her eyes. And in a look I can only describe as, well, duh. She said, he has a face he makes for yes, he has a face he makes for no, and when he wants something, he points. Interestingly, yes was a frown and no was a smile. The kids had no problem with that. So at the end of that year, we went off for summer vacation, and the first day of school came, first day of kindergarten. And Lauren was walking to school with another boy from her preschool class, who was a young boy with the label of autism and he lived in our neighborhood. And we were walking down the street, because we're only two blocks from the school, and when we got to the front door, Lauren and I went up to the front door entrance for kindergartners, and a well-meaning adult came around, took Ethan's hand, who was this young boy, and walked him to a different door. And Lauren turned to me in, in, in the way only five-year-olds can do, and went, why aren't we going in the same door? And it was that moment that I really understood how disablement works. My daughter didn't see disability in preschool. You just figure it out. But in that moment, that adult telling her, just simply moving the child to a different door, it was because it was closer to his classroom, because he had occupational therapy, because he needed some assistance. In that moment, I understood, from a kid's eyes, how school disables kids. I thought I would start. Um, <laughs> so welcome to all of you, not only from Syracuse University, which is here. This is the famous Hall of Languages. Welcome from Syracuse University and from all of the students. So the students that are here range from first year undergraduates to advanced doctoral students in a whole range of disciplines. So um, I know we have other students here from other programs, so I hope you take some time to ask lots of questions, not only of us, but of each other. So there they are. This is at the forum. <laughs> so my students will laugh at some of the images I've selected. I tried in, at key moments to put in some pieces from our trip. Um, <laughs> when I exported this to PowerPoint, the formatting is not quite right, but this was, in our words, the famous um, ancient Roman seagull <laughs> asking the question, what are the key tenets of disability studies? We were very excited by this <laughs> um, So I'm going to start 
with a few key ideas, key tenets, some of which are going to re be reiterations of things that Simona said. The first is the idea that disability is a natural part of the human experience. That does not sound groundbreaking, but it is. That, that it is actually the one category all of us will one day, hopefully, be lucky enough to attain. I want you to think about that. If we're lucky, we will all join this group. Why? Come on, students, why, Alan? Because you'll become elderly. You will get older. If we're lucky, we will all become disabled before we die. <laughs> so if, it's, if that's the case, then this can't be some foreign condition, right? This is a natural part of how people are. There are lots of ways of being in the world. Back to the nature, it's interdisciplinary. Um, while the field of disability seems to have really strong roots in the medical profession and the, and the professions of psychology and psychiatry, the field of disability studies is by its very nature interdisciplinary. Because disability is by its very nature interdisciplinary. Um, the idea is that there are, we really have to look at issues of architecture, we look at issues of theology, we look at the ways disability is constructed in media, we look at how disability operates in education, the way power operates to keep certain people out of particular places. So it is not, it doesn't make any sense to simply study disability through a lens of medicine because it impacts and is intersects with every area of our existence. It's also important to know that if we talk about disability studies from the U.S. context, in most universities, disability studies is not housed within education. Disability studies is housed within humanities or social sciences. Um, it is unusual, and we are actually uh, out of the norm for having disability studies housed within a school of education. And in fact, um, part of the reason the disability studies in education group sort of peeled itself away is because we really wanted to focus specifically on the impact of disability and disability studies on schooling, as opposed to looking at it strictly as a cultural phenomenon, a phenomenon in literature or in film, which was very, very heavily influenced in the field of disability studies in the US. Another key tenet that's actually very important in the work that I do is ideas that disability studies asks us to challenge all of our taken for granted notions about normalcy and other things as well. But it asks us to think about what do we believe to be true and where did that come from? Why do we assume it is better to walk than to roll? Why do we assume it is better to speak than to type? So those sorts of taken for granted assumptions and notions are very much the work of disability studies to interrogate. We're not just interested in, in providing access to typing. We also want to understand why, is, why do we automatically assume speech is better? Where does that <coughs> assumption come from? How has that worked its way into our cultural systems, into our structures in school? So part of the job of disability studies is to turn normal upside down, like my cows, <laughs> um, or to make normal bigger, or I would argue to blow up normal altogether so that we stop trying to define what's outside by defining what is inside. And part of when we're doing that, and this ties in with something um, that Simona was talking about in terms of are we changing people or changing structures, one of the things that in the early days of a mainstreaming, which is what we called it in the US, and then in early days of inclusion, it was very much about how do you bring different groups of kids into a dominant classroom, right? We're not going to change. This is our general education setting, and we are going to find ways to bring in English language learners, students of colors, color, students who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, students who are gifted with two moms, student kids with disabilities, um, kids who come from lower socioeconomic status. The idea was still, we design our classrooms and our schools for this mythical normal student that I hate to take, when you take all those kids out, there's no one left, but the idea is that we are thinking of this idea of normal that holds, and we will figure out how to bring you in, and if you can conform to our idea of normalcy, you may stay. And if you don't, then that just proves that you didn't belong there in the first place. So we would ask, from a disability studies perspective, what if instead you thought of all of those kids from the beginning? What if you assumed that every classroom or every, every community was going to include kids of diverse abilities, diverse, diverse cultural backgrounds, diverse language, diverse sexual orientation, diverse talents? If we assumed that from the beginning, 
we didn't, wouldn't need to change so much later. Um, this is the premise behind universal design. I'm going to challenge that a little bit later, but we'll start with key tenets, basic tenets, which is that if we thought of the widest possible range of users from the outset, we would need to do far less retroactive adaptation to what goes on in classrooms. Kids would be more successful, adults would be happier, everyone would win, right? That's the idea. If we thought of everyone up front instead of retroactively changing things, that's the idea of universal design. And you also have to remember, all of these identities are intersectional. And that's when I talk later about next new directions. This is one of the issues that we are coming up with and facing more and more in disability studies in the US, that you cannot think of children or adults as only being a student of an immigrant background. But they might also be a student who speaks a different language, and they might also be a student who has a disability. Those areas all intersect and in some ways compound each other. So we have to think about approaches to difference that account for all kinds of difference at the same time. One of the ways um, that we think about valuing different ways of being, and I'm just, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but the only way we change what normal looks like is if people see different examples of what constitutes normal. So for example, we have to have media representations that show disability not as tragedy, not as something to be cured, fixed, humanized, eliminated, gotten rid of, but just as part of life. We have to have, we have to read texts by people who identify as disabled in university and in public schools. We have to um, include disability in the curriculum. Not when we're teaching about disability. Like in the US, we really love to have special months for things like African American Awareness Month or Disability Autism Awareness Month. But when you talk about civil rights, talk about bus boycotts for people with, with they got to run in wheelchairs. So including disability in the curriculum helps us make disability part of the human condition as opposed to something that is exotic. We already talked a little bit about social construction, um, so I won't spend too long on this. I just love this cartoon. It shows a woman who has glasses on, and there's a whole set of signs that say attitudinal barriers, environmental barriers, communication barriers, and she walks up and touches one and says, and they're not even in Braille. <laughs> so the idea is that, again, social model is that it's not the person that's disabled, but the environment creates it. So we've already talked about that. <laughs> All right, where is this taken? Florence. Florence. More specifically? Piazza Piazza del Signoria, the Piazza de Plaza Vecchio, right? Okay. This is our Florentine lion. He is asking us about current tensions in DS and disability studies because all the lions want to know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of presentations. <laughs> Facciamo cambio professore. Ci accende notte. Ma andiamo alla chiesa in America, ci lasciamo spedire le cose. Andiamo in America, così. I, I will use my teacher voice. I have a good one. As I've been told. Um, I had to be shushed in one of the museums in Florence because I, my voice was carrying too much. So I'm going to use my, apparently I'm going to use my um, modern art voice. All right. We've talked about social construction as a key tenet of disability studies, and it is. But we are at this point in disability studies in the U.S. also struggling with how disability intersects and perhaps at times smashes up against other ideas about disability. Specifically, disability and notions of identity and notions of embodiment. So if we think of disability as wholly socially constructed, meaning my impairment doesn't become a disability until I hit a world that isn't made for me, that doesn't necessarily account for my lived experience. It doesn't necessarily account for how I may feel about my bodily experience. And there have been people in the disability community who have felt very marginalized by disability studies because they feel their disability in a way that is an embodied experience. 
For example, can anyone think of an example of a community that may resent social construction? Deaf culture? The deaf community. They embody it as a cultural identity. Um, people with autism. There's a growing movement to, for, for autistic pride, crit culture. And the idea being, I am autistic. This is who I am. I don't want to say you gave me this because I identify this way. It is an embodied, lived experience. So while we ground our work in the social model and social construction, we cannot ignore that there are people who feel very strongly that this is either a source of identity or a source of an embodied experience, and potentially one they wish they didn't have. Um, I just included this you quote. Okay. Because it, I think it brings together what we've talked about. Um, teachers using a DSE approach recognize that students' disability labels and the differences associated with those labels are not inherent in students, but created and sustained by social, political, and cultural assumptions about individuals considered to be outside the boundaries of normal. However, <laughs> while the cultural meanings of ability and disability are fluid and socially constructed, there are real material consequences for individuals living with those labels. Look, <laughs> we don't have to talk about that. I changed it. I had got this work for us. I changed it. <laughs> we, same, same, right? <laughs> That's my sign language for the day. Um, okay, but I'm going to ask one more question. Even if we are doing what it says on the top, even if we are being inclusive, if our schools are places where all kids are there and are engaged and are part of their communities, we have to also be asking the question about belonging. Are they desired to be there or are they tolerated being there? In Chris Cleaver's words, are they citizens of their classrooms or are they squatters in their classrooms? That's work actually dating back to the early 90s, but it still holds very true. So we have to ask this question about belonging, authentic belonging, and reciprocal relationships that aren't caring for kids with disabilities, but that are reciprocal and that both benefit from the presence of each other. Burton Blatt, a um, very famous member of the Syracuse community, was a leader in the right movement of deinstitutionalization in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s. And he wrote once, it is not enough to create something, even something good and decent for people. Eventually, there must be the element of participation. Being in classrooms is not enough. A key tenet of work in the United States, um, really growing out of work of Doug Bicklin, who was the former dean of the School of Education, and, and an uh, early scholar in disability studies, and the work of Anne Donnellan, is the idea of presuming competence, which is the idea that in an absence of evidence, you should presume that all people are, people are capable of far more than they're currently able to demonstrate with the resources they have. That's better. Um, and the idea is that if we presume competence, that puts the responsibility on us as educators to look for it. I would argue presuming competence is not enough. We have to actively construct it. We have to create contexts wherein children are able to be seen as competent by their peers. They have to not only be able to participate and engage in instruction, but they have to make that learning available to others as well. And that is the difference between presuming and constructing, and it is a much more active position for teachers to occupy. <coughs> I'll highlight just a couple things here. The most important being that I see construction of competence as not passive at all. It is very active and requires vigilance. It is an optimistic stance, but it also requires constant attention. Otherwise, we slip back into allowing kids to just be. But like all good disability studies scholars, we end everything with yet another problem, and that is even an idea of something like presuming or constructing competence still has the potential to hold up this idea of competence as capital, meaning something you betrayed it, right? And if you don't have it, are you still worthy of being in a classroom? So we have to be very careful that we're not, that we don't, 
we don't replace the word competence with intelligence because that's not what I mean. I look at presuming competence as educability. Everyone can learn. I'm sorry, it just looks like such a pensive look. I, he was actually deciding what wine to order, I think. But this is, this is my husband, John. Um, Did he, you ask him to, to post for him to put it for No, and he didn't know I was taking it. And, and he was not happy, and he doesn't know I'm showing it. Um, but he's flying back, so he doesn't know. Um, so I'm, in the interest of time, I'm only going to post two new directions because I didn't account for the time for translation. So I will, um, I will just choose two. So one of the things that this means, and this is really drawing on um, a lot of work from my colleague Beth Ferry, who's talking about this notion of inclusion 2.0. So instead of talking about inclusion as something that is solely about disability, <laughs> We need to position disability as part of a larger conversation around diversity. That is very much the direction that international human rights law has gone, but it is not the direction we have taken in the US. We have very, very, very much separated disability and diversity. Um, diversity encapsulates religion, culture, language, sexuality, and then disability is over here somewhere, and that has not served us well. So we have to be working in alliance with colleagues in across these sort of marginalized populations to be having conversations about inclusion is not supposed to be about special education. It never was. It was supposed to be about creating communities that serve all learners. So we need to stop talking about disability as if it is something different than other conversations about diversity. I'm just going to skip to it. And the last point I will make because we, we had a talk to, uh, uh, Simona talked about research and making sure people with disabilities are partners in research. But the last thing I want to talk about is one of the things that's been really troubling in the U.S. is a very narrow understanding of voice and who gets to participate in the construction of knowledge, both in terms of research but also in terms of participation. So one of the things that I've really been calling on is while we talk about expanded notions of normalcy, we also need to talk about expanded notions of voice and who has a right to participate. Um, a lot of my work is with non-speaking people and who communicate through diverse ways using alternative communication or support. And that is a, a group that even amongst disability study scholars is often very marginalized. So while we are constantly trying to think about ways to change systems, we also have to be internally vigilant about the ways we are um, policing our work within disability studies to make sure we are including all kinds of disabled people in that population. Mm -hmm. Disability studies has historically focused on physical and sensory disabilities, mm -hmm. often to the detriment of individuals perceived to have intellectual or developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. And just because, um, given this group, I'm really excited. We have a book coming out. Um, I've edited it um, with Megan Kosher. She and I have written a couple of chapters, and then we've invited up many other disability studies scholars from the US. And the whole purpose of this book is how you take the principles of disability studies and apply them to the practical work of teachers. So there's a chapter on writing IDPs. There is a chapter on doing functional behavioral analyses. There's a chapter on me working with parents and on collaboration. And every scholar had the challenge of taking the philosophies and principles of disability studies and then actually saying, what would that mean if you were teaching in a school? So for those of you um, that are looking to, to try to bring pieces of disability studies into your own work and you don't have a great system to do that, this might be a useful resource. Um, Beth Ferry has a chapter, David Connor, Doug Bicklin, Jan Valley. It's, it's quite an extensive list of people from the US. Um, so I want to thank you all so very much, and I'd be happy to answer questions when we're done. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.